Hi, hello, this is the second video in my series devoted to business models uh, in the media industry or in the film and TV production industry. Uh, if you have watched the first video, the, so the, the hash one uh, video about business models in the media industry, you probably know that I started with presenting or with introducing two business cases namely Netflix on the one hand and Discovery Communications on the other hand. And I am working with their annual reports for 2019 as my main comparative material. And in this video, uh, I want to introduce very much the same general concept, which you can also find in my video devoted to business models in uh, the industry of renewable energies. Namely, I want to, intro to introduce the concept of the capital account and of the business model seen from the perspective of the capital base or the capital account of a company. So I will be introducing in this video like the same theory about the capital account, namely the balance sheet of a company. And then I will illustrate uh, in the case of both Netflix and Discovery Communications how you can use that capital account to sort of deconstruct the business model of a precise company. So I go first of all to explaining questions uh, relative to the capital account. And I will use Netflix as my starting case, as my starting material. Uh, okay, so here we are with their annual report. Okay, uh, once more second, I needed to fit the window of the report in the window of the video. I quickly jump over the top corner of the report and here we are with Netflix. So once again, we are working with the annual report of Netflix Incorporated pursuant to section 13 or 15D of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. This time, as we will be interested in, or as I am interested, in the financials of the company and like in the detailed financials, I go to this specific uh, item in the table of contents, Exhibits Financial Statement Schedules. I go there and here is Consolidated Balance Sheets. Uh, the balance sheet or the balance sheets is the capital account of a business. Uh, if, you want, uh, if you want to understand the logic of the capital account, you can assume that any, anyone, any person, any company, any social entity has something. A anyone has some material possessions. So they can be physical things, they can be legal claims on third people, uh, everyone has something and what everyone has or what I have or what a given person has or, or what a given company has are assets. Now, usually we owe some money to external agents, like to third entities. And it is the same case with, um, with companies. Companies usually owe money to third entities. They have some debt, what we call they have liabilities. And when you take the total value of assets of a company and from that you subtract the total value of its liabilities, you stay like, you see, you stay like with the really own proprietary part of assets and that part is called equity. Equity is like my own money in the assets that I hold. 
And here is the, Netf uh, uh, the consolidated balance sheets of Netflix. I will make it slightly bigger to make it as visible on the screen as possible. Uh, now, one remark. Um, the balance sheet is frequently called a T account, like the letter T. No? Okay. So, you can imagine a letter T where there is a space under the roof of the letter T and that space is divided in half in two identical sides uh, with that leg of the letter T. And this is how a balance sheet should be read. One side, what we call the active side or the assets of the company, should have rigorously the same value, the same value at the bottom line, as the value of equity and liabilities. So as the value of what we call the passive side of the balance sheet. Now, let's look quickly at the assets of Netflix, at its capital account. Total assets here are 33,975,712,000 dollars. So, 33. Um, actually almost 34 billions of dollars. Now, if we go at the bottom line of the total liabilities and stockholders' equity here, you can see that this bottom line is exactly the same. 33,975,712,000 of dollars. This, this is the logic of the T account. That's the logic of the passive side of the balance sheet being rigorously equal to the active side of the balance sheet. Now we will play a quick game. In a moment we will, we will play the same game with Discovery. Uh, the game is something that I practice frequently with my students. I take first the active side of the balance sheet of a company and then the passive side and I ask my students just to find the, like, noticeably the biggest numbers in the column, in the list. Those biggest numbers are the most important capital components of the business model that we are studying. So let's have a look at the assets of Netflix. Here is the bottom line. And the number that sort of sticks out of the crowd the most clearly, the most like blatantly, is, the, is this category, non-current content assets. Now, two words of explanation as for the meaning of the term. First, content assets. When you watch Netflix, each of those items of content that you can choose on your Netflix screen, each separate show, each separate movie, each separate documentary, is a content asset in the balance sheet of Netflix. Because those pieces of content are pieces of Netflix's business. They are like machines in a factory. They earn money for Netflix. Now, the concept of non-current as opposed to current. Uh, when you run a business, you can notice, like by common sense observation, two important things. That first of all, your business needs something, some things or some rights, to like be there, installed, operational and present all the time. And these are non-current assets. Uh, technically, in legal terms, anything that a company holds for longer than 12 months, so for longer than one year, are non-current assets. Anything that is being held for a shorter period of time than one year are current assets. And uh, 
With the current assets comes another common sense observation about any kind of business, essentially. When you run a business, there are certain things and certain rights which need to sort of circulate in your business. They need to turn out or turn around instead of just being there and being installed. So those assets which are like fixed and installed are the non-current ones. And those which are supposed to circulate, to turn out in order to make the business turn, are the current assets. And now if we return to the numbers, we can see that non-current content assets, so shows, documentaries and movies, which are on the Netflix platform for more than one year, so for at least 12 months and one day, those ones make the most important part of the Netflix's active capital base, so of Netflix's assets. Uh, it is 24.5 billion out of 33.9 millions of dollars. At the second position, we have cash and cash equivalents, 5 billions of dollars. So on the active side of the balance sheet of Netflix, we have those two dominant uh, components of their business model, non-current content assets and cash. So we can guess that from the point of view of the active side of the balance sheet, the business of Netflix or the business model of Netflix consists in creating a big base of shows, a big base of content, which stays on the platform for longer than one year. Uh, in addition to, the, to the, that, the company obviously needs cash uh, in or, order probably to stay flexible in the purchase of uh, uh, rights to content which might just come their way with, like without warning. Now let's look at the passive side of the balance sheet. So we have various types of liabilities. In another video I will go more in depth into those types of uh, liabilities. And we have equity. Equity which is composed of the value of common stock, of returned earnings. And this is the total equity. First of all, we can notice that in the Netflix's balance sheet, liabilities make 26.4 billions of dollars out of almost 34 billions of dollars of total capital being invested in the company. So this company works mostly on the basis of debt. They work mostly on borrowed money rather than on the proprietary invested capital. Once again, the same game. In the total list of liabilities and equity of Netflix, we look just for the biggest numbers, for the numbers that really stick out of the crowd. And here we are. Long-term debt, 14.76 billions of dollars. And retained earnings, 4.8 millions of dollars. So by now putting back to back the, uh, the observations from the active side of the balance sheet and observations from the passive side, we have the following business model. It is a business model which relies on long term borrowing. So on borrowing for over one year uh, of maturity time combined with retaining profits after tax made in past years. These are retained earnings. And those two financial like levers, so the lever of long-term borrowing and the lever of retaining profits from past years, those two levers move the principal component of assets in Netflix which are the non-current content assets and accessorily it serves to power the reserve of cash. So that's the logic of 
the business model of Netflix seen from the point of view of their balance sheet. Now let's do the same with the balance sheet of uh, Discovery. So I kick Netflix out of the window and I will put there the annual report of Discovery and we'll go to their balance sheet and Okay. Let me make that report slightly bigger and I quickly jump over its corner. And here we are. We go to discovery. Here is the report. Just let me check how it can be seen in the in the window. Okay. So it is the same report that you could see in the first video devoted to uh, uh, to, uh, to those two cases and to business models in the media industry. So the annual report pursuant to Section 13 or 15D of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. I go to the table of contents and here I click at the same item, on the same item, as you could see me clicking in the case of Netflix. So consolidated, uh, consolidated balance sheets. And here we are. Assets, liabilities and equity. First of all, you can see that, incidentally, uh, capital-wise, Discovery uh, has almost the same capital base as Netflix. Here, data is in millions, so their total capital at the end of 2019 was 33.7 billions of dollars. In the case of Netflix, it was 33.70 nine, I think, billions of dollars. So they are very close. They are very close to each other in terms of uh, the capital base. It might be an indication that if you want to be like a serious player in the media business, you need that amount of money to be like in the Champions League uh, uh, of the big players of that business. So once again, the same game we try to look for the biggest items asset-wise and the biggest items liabilities and equity-wise. Here we can see like two items sticking very clearly out of the total list. It is goodwill and intangible assets. You can see it here. Uh, Goodwill makes 13 billions of dollars or made at the end of 2019 13 millions of dollars and intangible assets uh, were 8.66 or, or 8.67 billions of dollars. First of all, I explain uh, those two categories as they are quite important in the type of business that Discovery is running. First of all, the simpler one, intangible assets. Intangible assets are essentially rights to something or claims on something which have a special kind like of market capital value. For example, the market value of a logo, the market value of a brand, the market value of uh, intellectual property connected to some kind of content. All these are intangible assets. Now, goodwill uh, is a typically financial jargon based term. It has nothing to do with the morally understood goodwill. Goodwill in finance and in business is something completely different. Here it comes. 
As you might remember from the first video on business models in the media industry, Discovery he is a sort of very branched out into many platforms. I will just go back to the table of contents and then go back to, to the beginning of the report to, uh, to remind it about it. So if we read the description of uh, the business of Discovery, it goes like, we are a global media company that provides content across multiple distribution platforms, including linear platforms such as pay television, free to air and broadcast television. Uh, here it, it, it goes and here we have brands and platforms that uh, Discovery owns and, and or uh, operates inside their business. It is Discovery Channel. HDTV, Food Network, TLC, Animal Planet, Investigation Discovery, Travels Channel, Science Channel, and so on. If you have such a like multi-brand, multi-business business, usually that diversity was created by mergers and acquisitions. If, if Discovery Communications is operating such a multitude of brands and platforms, it is because over time they have been acquiring control over those platforms. Usually they were buying some kind of platform or content or brand already created by someone else and they were just taking over, buying that from the initial creator. When you do something like that, so when a big company uh, buys or acquires the control of something like a smaller business entity, so when the big fish swallows a small fish, the big fish pays, pays like a special price for swallowing the small fish. So in technical terms, when you are a big company and you want to acquire like a controlling uh, package of shares in a smaller company, you usually overpay over, uh, uh, over the price, over the market price of those shares. In other terms, if you want to acquire control of an already existing business, you overpay for control. Control has its price. So every time uh, when Discovery Communications was buying another already existing platform, when they were buying control in that platform, they had to pay an extra price for control. And that extra price for control is precisely goodwill. So goodwill, those 13 billions of dollars in the balance sheet of Discovery Communications, is the sum total of all those uh, like prices for control that Discovery has paid over time to various owners and founders of those platforms that they acquired. So goodwill is like the, <laughs> we could say it is like the accumulated value of capital control in the I'm sorry something okay, okay is the total value of capital control that uh, discovery has acquired over time in many smaller businesses that they have swallowed over time so we have already one component of uh, discovery's uh, business model. On the active side of, of the balance sheet, their most important assets consist of control over many acquired platforms and brands in the first place. This is the importance of goodwill. And secondly, it is the value of intangible assets. Now we look on the side of liabilities and equity. Here, of course, the bottom line is the same as the bottom line of assets, so 33.73 billions of dollars. 
And now in the total list of liabilities and equity, we look for the biggest numbers, for something that like sticks out of the crowd very clearly. And we have two numbers. We have essentially two two-digit numbers in the, uh, 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 on the passive side of the balance sheet. One is 14.8 14 billions of dollars here, right here, uh, which corresponds to the non-current portion of debt. Non-current debt means that this is debt payable over more than one year. So it is debt which will be payable certainly later than over the next 12 months. And the next two digit or the, or, the, or the next number which has two digits in billions is this additional paid in capital 10.7 billions of dollars. Just to explain you this category, so the category of additional paid in capital. Uh, when you start a business, you can adopt a financial strategy which consists in making initially just a small uh, equity base to pay just some money into the, uh, into the equity base of the business. And then as the business grows, shareholders can pay the additional money, an additional capital into the business structure, into the equity of the business structure. And this is additional paid in capital, 10.7 billions of dollars. So summing up this analysis, uh, if we read the balance sheet of discovery here, the business model that sort of emerges from that informed reading is a model where the company mostly borrows money on long term. So this is that non-current portion of debt. They borrow money on long term and the shareholder of the business progressively pay in portions of equity. So they collect or accumulate that additional pay in capital. And that stream of money like put into the business is being invested mostly in two things. In acquiring control over smaller independent platforms of broadcasting or distribution. So it is being invested in accumulating goodwill and it is being invested in intangible assets. And here is the business model of discovery. Uh, you can see now like a common denominator between uh, Netflix and discovery. They all rely very uh, heavily on long-term debt. It is like a particular trait of those businesses in the general, let's say, media industry or the industry of uh, uh, filmmaking, television production, broadcasting, streaming. They rely heavily on long-term debt, so on money borrowed for more, for more than one year. So on long-term liabilities, and they apparently rely heavily on a mechanism of progressive accumulation of equity by small payments from shareholders. Okay, that would be all in the video number two devoted to business models in the media industry. As usually, I wish you to have fun with science and enjoy this Monday afternoon. Bye-bye.